Again, uh, my name is John. I'm a data scientist. I my day job is as a data scientist at Numina. Numina is a sensor company that does traffic tracking, uh, specifically focusing on micro mobility and vulnerable users. So tracking pedestrians and bicycles. We have a pilot study going on right now in New York City with the Greenway Brooklyn Greenway Initiative and also to go with MTA and DOT. So I have been looking at like data coming from buses for quite a while lately. Um, also before starting at Numina, I was the director of the Spatial Analysis and Visualization Initiative at the Pratt Institute. I have been teaching data analysis, visualization, and GIS courses there for the last five, six years. And originally I'm from Istanbul. I moved to New York about five years ago and I have been very much involved in this like open data environment uh, ecosystem since I came here. Um, Marco is um, at McGill University. He's in Canada. He's originally from Italy. Uh, he does a lot of studies kind of comparing Canadian practices, American practices, and Italian practices around transit. I am more of the data person in the team. He is the public transit and policy person. Uh, he's a fellow, he's a fellow, right, at the Marin Institute in NYU um, at the transit and land use, transportation and land use program. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about it um, as well in a little bit. All right. So, um, I said I moved to New York City about five years ago from Istanbul, and Istanbul being a city of 20 million people, usually like the image that's associated with it is that it's this undesigned mess. It's like 2,000 years old. You can't really do anything. It has like large areas that's been transformed from slums. It's unplanned, but like my professional life there has been about it being unplanned, but. The first, I think, like week or so that I came to New York, I had to go to Pratt to deliver a talk. And G was not working, of course, because it was a weekend. And I took the bus. And immediately, like the first weekend, I noticed the buses are extremely slow here. It took me 45 minutes to get from Greenpoint to Clinton Hill. It takes 15 minutes on a bike. It, I think, takes about 35 minutes when you walk. But it took me 45 minutes. Uh, so, you know, like already my introduction to buses were a little bit negative and also like, you know, weekend day, it was a beautiful sunny day. There wasn't any traffic. It's like eight o'clock in the morning. So it's not just traffic and the busyness, but I recognize like something weird is going on. And for the last um, year, my son has started at the public school system. So every day in the morning I take this bus. This is B43. Uh, 43, one of the slowest buses in New York, it, uh, uh, if you don't know. Oops, sorry, I'm trying to see my notes. And again, um, if we walk this route to his school every day, it takes about like between eight to nine, eight to 10 minutes. With bus, it takes about 20, right? So of course, it's not a very good comparison, like in short distances, walking can be better. You don't have to wait for the bus. So it's not, uh, it's not fair, but still sometimes, you know, like the speed of the bus is comparable with almost walking speed sometimes. And we believe um, like if this issue around speed with the buses were to be resolved, New York City might have a fantastic chance to take an incredible step to the future using buses in its transit, because we know building subways is incredibly expensive in the city. Um, Elifier has been working on a study to show how expensive it is to, has been to build the Second Avenue subway. It was one of the most expensive in the world per kilometer, I believe. Uh, and buses don't have most of these costs. It doesn't it need tunnels. The vehicle of the bus is much simpler. It can be flexible. It can make new routes. You can make new stops as you need. You can have different services throughout the week. If you need maintenance, they can take different routes, right? Like the flexibility of it really helps. And we know that there are many cities in the world that actually use this flexibility to its advantage. Um, I would say, I think Istanbul is one where we're from. And you know, like my engagement with buses so far has been more just complaining about it. So like a bunch of fathers, we wait in the morning for the bus and we complain how slow it is. But 
Michael had a much more scientific approach to how to measure this. Um, he has an amazing blog, if you are like super into transit, called Urban Letters. Um, as a Substack, or you can follow him on Twitter as well, Mike Wichiti. Uh, he posts quite a lot and very insightful thoughts about uh, generally like urban transit, and it's very like comparative of New York versus other places in the world. But he has been trying to take the buses from first stop to the last, uh, try to count how long it takes from one step to the other, talking to the agencies, operators in the meantime. But he's been doing it in Bologna. It's a much more like a manageable city, but like a smaller environment. And also, I think he has much better access to officials in the city. He can like pester them when he wants to. Um, but so we met about like four months ago and we started talking like, can we do this kind of like very detailed trip by trip, stop to stop kind of analysis and scale it up to New York City, do it to other cities and compare as well. Oh, I'm pressing the wrong things here. OK. So our study is sponsored by NYU's Marin Institute. Marco is there. And um, their approach in transit, uh, sorry, transportation and land use group have kind of guided the way that we think about this study as well. Um, the, they've released an amazing report, I believe, a year or so ago called Transit Cost Project. And the idea was to compare how much it costs to build subways here versus in other places. Right? So, and that's very interesting to me because whenever I talk to people or like complain about New York, there's this kind of exceptionality of New York that is, I don't know, I think ingrained in all of us. I would say like, of course it's different in New York. Of course it's more expensive in New York, right? Like kind of expect things to be. And when you put in a global perspective, there are many places that you can compare New York to. And in some ways, we do perform worse here. Things are more expensive, et cetera. Have you taken the picture? Yeah, OK. Um, also, visit their site, uh, read their reports. It's really fantastic. They're working on a high-speed rail report similarly uh, now. OK. So uh, of course, to make a comparative study, we had to start with a list of cities that we can compare with. We had a very long list. We were very ambitious, and we had amazing goals. We thought beta access would be much easier, um, and it would be a lot more standard. It wasn't. So we ended up with uh, the list of cities that you see on the right. So before even going more into detail, I have to say the comparisons that we get with New York City is not completely like apples to apples. It is very hard to find cities that are comparable to New York all the time. So we have a few. Uh, but also, I think like as we increase the number of cities that we have, it will be resolved. Um, I also have a few asterisks there for the cities that we're left with. Um, I will get into a little bit more detail of it. But some cities use data in a very different way. And it makes comparisons quite hard. So there's some issues with the data even when we find it. But um, this spreadsheet has been guiding us for like where to find the data, what are some custom parameters that we have to keep in mind, um, what code cities use for bus services versus tram services and things. So uh, it's a running list. We're increasing it. And we're also trying to get a better distribution around the world. It is a little bit like North America centric right now because the data standards are, are, are better uh, like in this part of the world. Um, yeah, and like we've been trying to add more cities from South America and East Asia. Uh, I think especially East Asia will be a fantastic addition to it because their transit systems, uh, the efficiency standards are very, very different. But China does not use any standards that are associated with Google. Uh, Japan publishes their data in a, such a different format that we don't even know what it is yet. Uh, I think Korea also does not use Google products. And our main data set, GTFS, is one. So um, how many of you are familiar with the data uh, standard called GTFS? Oh, some. OK, it's much better than I thought. So for some of you, a little bit of the presentation might be a little bit too simple, but you know, a general introduction will be good. So um, 
GDF, uh, GTFS data is not available as the uh, in the open data platform, but New York City publishes this data set. It is the so I wrote it somewhere, but um, generalized transit so, uh, feeds. Yeah, specification. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, also, the G sometimes is used as Google as well because I think it's the standard that they kind of came up with to be able to show timetables well. Um, New York City, by NTA and all the other transit agencies publish this data. It is available online. It is fairly easy to access. It just is not in the portal. Um, you can access it from this website, Transitland. After, I think, like some kind of access, it requires a login. Um, for like, I think the bulk downloads, you might need to pay a little bit, but that is mostly, I would say, um, open. And we are using data from MTA for this one. Um, New York City breaks it down per borough, and I think the transit system is kind of fragmented here as well. There's like almost five separate bus services. You might have noticed your buses. Six buses. Yeah. Uh, they start with like the borough names, right? Like the BX, M. Um, SI and whatnot. Um, also, GTFS data is published in two different streams. One of them is the scheduled data, and the other one is the real-time data. Um, real-time data is quite difficult to use. It's not necessarily made for analysis purposes. You have to actually like track it and download it if you want. The historic access, as far as I know, it's not necessarily accessible. Um, and that just includes so much more complexity into the data collection process that we decide to use the scheduled data. Um, assuming that all the problems in the city since the bus service has been running for a while will be included in the schedule. Like the city will not be thinking that this, the speed will not be 100 kilometers per hour. If the bus is going slow, they will, um, they will make the scheduling for that. Um, GTFS data comes in a relatively standard format. The basic things that you'll find in the data are these um, text documents. It is a weird way of sharing data, but it's a text document. There are a bunch of text documents. They work in a relational way, so every part of the data can be attached to each other. I'll show how it works. But it is more of a suggestion to the cities rather than a very strict standard. So every time you go to a different city's data, it will be quite a lot different actually, not even slightly, um, as some asterisks because some cities choose not to use the calendars in the, in, in the standard format. They don't use dates, but they just add and remove services as they need to and just assume that things are as they are when they're not added or removed. Um, some of the cities, if the network is really very complex and big like Paris, they do not publish the shapes, so the routes exactly are not very clear. They will be more like flat, like simple lines from stop to stop, and of course, like that will really throw um, our analysis. It wouldn't be very easy. Uh, but New York's data looks like that. New York really publishes it with fantastic quality. Um, many different systems, including even I think the boat service is here. So. OK. Um, so the data is relational. And the main reason for that is you might need access to schedules in so many different ways. You can be in a bus stop and, be, and only care about what time the next bus is coming. You can be in a certain location and only care about where is the next bu closest bus stop is. Or you might be like me, where you're just trying to get a very big understanding of what the data is. But uh, it starts from the agency level at the top. Then it goes to roots. The roots will be the more or less familiar names that we know. So B43 is my um, autonomous bus service. And it has a very uh, different specification called trips. Every time a bus leaves from the main bus stop, or the first bus stop, let's say, that is a trip. So there might be multiple, multiple, multiple trip, trips per route throughout the day. Um, 
And then the tips get connected to shape IDs. And then the shape IDs here um, are what's showing like the geographic, let's say, representation of the routes. If this exists, it makes your life a lot easier. But also from trip IDs, you get to stop times where you get access to the schedule. And then through the schedule, you get to the stop locations. Right? Like, so you have to make several joins to create a single data set from it um, to be able to, let's say, like, make a more broader analysis. We created our data as more like a wide data set. That's more of a JS data. Um, of course, like when you put all of these cities trips underneath each, each other, we ended up with millions and millions of rows. So it's not necessarily very operable in a JS setting. But um, if anyone is interested, would be happy to share it. Kind of, it takes quite a bit of work to actually uh, get it up to a processable standard and standardizing all of that. And at the end of the day, when you do all of the joins, when you see all of it together, this is kind of what it looks like. This is still be 43 um, going all the way down. You can see that on the root, there are actually two lines. So one route can have more than one shape. As it goes in one route, it might be coming back from another. Or in different schedules, it might be using a different route based on the route directions. But even in one uh, route, in this like B43 here, uh, we actually have quite a wide distribution of speeds, right? Like, so there are times in the day or in the week that it actually goes over 18 kilometers an hour. For a bus anywhere in the world, that's quite a good speed. Um, I think, yeah, it's like it might be even higher than like the speed of a car in New York, like the average. But it falls down to eight kilometers an hour as well. So that should be around like six miles per hour, I think, where it become closer to like walking speeds or like jogging speeds at that time. Um, and before doing any filtering, this includes very early day trips, weekend trips. Like if you take bus four o'clock in the morning, you might wait for it a long time, but it will go quite fast because it doesn't have to stop for very long in, in many places. Um, I talked about some cities missing routes. Uh, we have developed a quiet, Extend, uh, expensive, I guess, uh, or a complicated system to fill in the gaps in the data. So uh, as an example, Istanbul did not have the, have the roots data, but what they have is stop locations. So what we do is we go into OSM, fantastic, another fantastic data source that's outside of the open data portal. You can download the bus routes. So every kind of like bus corridor uh, that the buses travel within, it will come as a line. Um, OSM data is not that easy to operate, but it's, you know, it's doable. And then we split that into segments, as in like stop-to-stop -stop segments, create every single possible stop-to-stop -stop combination in New York, and then start matching those with the lines that we've drawn using a network analysis, and then combine all of those lines and create one route at the end. And Marco goes in and checks a random percentage of the data sets to check if we are actually calculating the data, uh, the routes correctly. We've done this in Istanbul and um, Paris. The accuracy is surprisingly high. Uh, I didn't know OSM's bus routes data will be that great, but it really is like surprisingly very, very good. So a very simple, like shortest distance between two bus stops usually gives you something that's quite, sorry, quite doable. So <clears throat> bus services are quite diverse. You cannot necessarily compare a Saturday morning, 7 o'clock, with a midday or like a midtown rush hour at a Wednesday night. Right? We have to kind of get it to a point where we're comparing somewhat similar kind of services. Otherwise, the averages that you get will end up being all over the place. We. Um, <clears throat> We decided on three filters. Of course, like every time you filter the data, you're also um, changing the results of the study a little bit by how you're deciding the thresholds. We've tried to change them slightly to see if the results were changing, and it kind of didn't. Like, it was fine. Um, but we decided on removing trips that have 
an average stop distance for of more than 500 meters. It, we first came up with 800 meters, and then we've been like trying on every single city to see if we can remove the services that go onto highways. Or if they're not even going on highways, but like very large boulevards, the Grand Concourse in Bronx, or you know, like the Eastern Parkway, or whatever, like these places where they kind of operate as more like express services. We want inner city services that are operating as a usual bus that you would take. And we do this for every city. And when we did it for New York, I think the result is kind of encouraging. I would think these are like the major high-speed roads in New York. Of course, there are traffic on them, right? Uh, so not all of them go very quickly either. Uh, the second filter that we use, a geographic filter, it's very simple. We only take routes that intersect with a 10-mile radius of the city center. This is Izmir. It's one of our control cities. Um, we use like Bologna. New York, Izmir, and Istanbul as our control cities. Just because I know Izmir very well, I can kind of see what is where. But how the city is defined in terms of its admin boundaries really changes the bus service as well. So let's say like on the northern end, New York starts at a line. And if you're driving through it, you'll actually recognize this line because the minute you enter, there'll be traffic. So like within the boundaries of New York, it is all this, all city. but. Izmir, let's say the city is more defined as a county. They're called the metropolitan areas. And you can travel for 350 kilometers and you'll still be in the same city, right? Like the airport is there. And then this is practically a summer destination where people go to the beach. So, and the bus runs, it runs quite effectively. Um, in cities like, let's say, Bologna, it was even more weird because they had additional city centers. There's another city that's almost as big as Bologna, but slightly smaller, somehow it got incorporated into the city area. And in US, you have the other way around, like the problem in the reverse direction, where you have a city like Los Angeles, where parts of the middle of the city is not a part of it. Right? And the third filter that we're using is, of course, we only use weekday services. And we took trips from 5 AM to 11 PM. In New York, the rush hour kind of dies down quickly around like 7.30 or 8. The rush hour traffic is finished. Um, I know in New York, Christine, there's a lot of traffic in New York, but compared to other cities, there isn't. Right? Like, let's say in Istanbul, I would consider the rush hour goes until 11 p.m. And then it starts again at 2 p.m. At uh, 2 a.m., sorry. Um, so we kind of kept those quite um, long. A little bit more. Uh, I don't know if any of you were this much interested in GTFS, but if you see the data, you will not be surprised. There's a lot of strange things in the data. You have to be aware when you work with it. And until you plot it, see it, you, you never know. So my control city, Izmir, failed immediately when I started plotting the speeds, because this is the speed that it think Izmir officials thinks how buses operate. After 6 o'clock in the morning, they think the bus just goes at the same speed. Right, like they made all of their calculations based on that. It is 14 kilometers an hour. In a way, it's not because like they're lazy or bad people or they don't care. It is, I think, kind of a, shows the mentality that they operate buses in. The city is so chaotic sometimes. They just try to make sure the headways are correct. So a bus leaves in every 15 minutes, 10 minutes, whatever. And the rest is up to the higher powers uh, that you know govern. The world, I guess. Uh, so and as even when you're living in Izmir, let's say if you go to a bus stop, there will never be a schedule on the bus stop. You never know by the minute when it will arrive. But you'll more or less know there will come in every 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever. Like It's a much more loose way of working with um, schedules. Another kind of problem that we kept on having is um, Los Angeles. I also lived in LA for a long time. I'm very familiar with the bus services. I didn't have a car there for five years in 2005. It was a terrible experience. Um, so if any of you are familiar, the like this part of the city is Santa Monica, and the tail of it is going into Beverly Hills. And those are not incorporated areas. They're outside of Los Angeles. And I think there are some of their bus services are separate, and these smaller agencies might not be really doing scheduling, right? So like, may, even if they're doing, they might not be as careful as the bigger city. Maybe the routes are shorter. Um, maybe the frequent, like, 
it's not as crowded, right? Like maybe they don't need to care. So, you know, every, uh, every part of the data had somewhat of a problem in this case, in, in some way or the other. We tried to keep as much of it as possible. Um, and, you know, assuming that just the size of the data will remove some of the problems. And yeah, after all of this introduction of, I don't know, like 18 slides, we come to the conclusion again. I mean, obviously, I think like everyone thinks New York is the slowest here. The bus speeds in New York is the slowest among the 11 cities that we compared. Um, but also, we have to acknowledge that New York and Paris are the only two actually really large cities that we were able to include in our study. So I don't want to be very unfair to New York. Uh, but if I have to still like 12 kilometers per hour is a really low. Um, and you know, like the some American cities have a very strange geographic features to it. Just historically, they developed in weird ways that makes their services really fast. I believe uh, we tried to look into it with uh, Michael. Like, why is Madison doing so well? And it's I think because uh, Madison is built around two lakes. The city is kind of wedged into these two big lakes. And what remains in between them ended up being an inner city highway. And the city is kind of developed on both sides of it. So a lot of the buses end up taking a highway that is not referred to as a highway. Right? Like we can't really filter it without filters, but uh, it should be. And they end up being super, super fast. Um, yeah, I tried to write like what 12 kilometers mean. It's 7.5 miles an hour. It's really not much. If you're biking in the city, um, according to some sources, you expect to go between 12 to 16 kilometers an hour, right? So uh, you go quite a lot faster than the bus. And here, um, I think like in our next iteration of the study, we would like to increase the number of cities we have for more than 10 million people. And for that, we need help from the East Asian cities. Hopefully, we'll get to their um, data. <clears throat> and when we plot the speeds, um, speeds in bins, in a single kilometer bin starting from six kilometers an hour, we can kind of see the distribution of how it is. Um, New York at the bottom, of course. But what is interesting for us here, of course, like we should ignore Izmir because their scheduling is really weird with speed. But we have some cities like uh, Bologna or Zurich where the distribution is uh, distribution have smaller tails, <clears throat> let's say, and we assume this is because they have one way or another, like a zero, what is it called, um, like a zero delay policy, or they try to keep the bus speeds very much consistent throughout the day, so that when you take the bus, you're not running into surprises where your morning bus, morning commute took 15 minutes, but your evening commute took 45, let's say. And to be able to do that, you of course need to change the way that you think about the city, about planning, about the environment that your transit runs in, right? Like just by saying this bus will go fast, it usually does not go very fast. And um, I'm going to show a few variations of this um, chart. This is how the speed looks like throughout the day, again, broken into Hourly, was it? No, I think like 15 minute intervals. <clears throat> so the data itself, if you plot it immediately, it will not be this smooth. I have to say that I'm using kind of a, um, a rolling average of sorts here in a time series to make it a little bit more understandable to get rid of all the little uh, deviations from the data. So that's why it's so smooth. The scheduling doesn't work this well normally. But you can see that, again, our New York Data is at the very bottom. And what is quite interesting for us to see here is that the morning commute and the evening commute, like the rush hour behaviors in cities are quite different. Um, <clears throat> we know that New York has a smaller dip in the morning and its evening dip is quite large. That also very much corresponds to my personal experience in the city, um, where <clears throat> the same bus, if you take it in the evening, it might be much, much slower. And some cities like Bologna here, they kind of managed to keep a much more consistent speed. 
Izmir is faking its success. <clears throat> uh, we can look at the same graph in terms of change, how much the deviation happens throughout the day in terms of speeds. And here, the very fast cities like Quebec will see a much more dramatic drop in their speed, obviously, because you know, like you can't really sustain a service that goes over 30 kilometers an hour every day. Um, and here, New York is kind of in the middle, you know, like if you think how much it deviates, of course, like it having lower speeds affects uh, that as well. <clears throat> Um, sorry, this is an absolute kilometer, so um, that's why I'm saying like faster will have like bigger change. And we've been thinking with Marco like how like what will be the right metric to think about this because like this deviation to us means quite a lot. If a bus, when you remove the external environmental factors, if it's able to go with like a certain speed, and just as the day progresses, if it has to slow quite a lot, where it comes to a crawl practically we are interpreting it in a way that the environment is not cooperating with the bus buses, right? Like maybe the bus corridors are not working, or maybe it's the way that the stops are positioned, the red lights are positioned, and all of that. <clears throat> uh, at least, so it's a bit of a lengthy title here, but from the uh, when we look at the deviation from the mean for each city, uh, we took the percent of it, percent deviation and then did a sum of squares to see how much they deviate and remove the uh, negative values. And here, Boston seems to show the most deviation throughout the day, right? So like the morning services will be the fastest there compared to evening services. New York City is the second. So still we're seeing quite a bit of a difference between morning and evening services there. Again, Paris always follows New York right behind. Um, but the central Paris is almost twice as more dense than New York, right? Like, so even there, actually, it's not a fair, fair comparison for Paris. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm just looking if I'm missing anything. Um, I have like 10 minutes, so I should get a little faster, sorry. Uh, so yeah, we got really interested in like the environment that the bus runs in and what could be comparable uh, metrics that we can or data that we can find that's open and also uh, accessible for all the cities. And Marco had this idea to take a look at controlled intersections. Right, so stop, light, stop signs and traffic lights. This data is to a quite good extent available in OpenStreetMaps. And um, of course, stop signs are what kind of slows down and manages traffic in American traffic, but in other cities, they're not used much. It's a very like American-centric way of thinking about traffic, just to stop things every block. Um, so even traffic lights, not always used, like the roundabouts or a free pass or hierarchies will be used. And the controlled intersections are a little difficult to use because sometimes they're too close to each other. Sometimes both stop signs in a single intersection might be represented so we develop some very like js centric ways to offset or buffer them by a certain meter and then combine them into a single id and counting the number of ids that a trip crosses rather than each single stop to eliminate uh, duplicates that especially becomes a problem in like the weird intersections in new york where like the like the fault and triangle kind of these very like sharp connect sharp connections And we um, looked at the density of traffic signs a bus trip encounters and how fast it goes. New York, Seattle, Paris. And in all of the cities, there's a more or less a linear-ish correlation. Some, I think like Melbourne didn't have it, it was just random. Uh, but most of the cities show some kind of a correlation here. When you put in the words, it's quite easy to understand, you know, like if a bus is stopping more, it will go slower. But to see it on a graph and seeing such an immediate impact of it, I think to me is quite effective. And um, if you see the, if you look at the x-axis, they're not on the same scale, right? So in New York, there are buses who are encountering 12 stops per kilometer. It's really quite insane. Like every, um, what is it? Like less than 100 meters, like 80 meters, it has to stop. It's like the short side of a block almost. And 
other North American cities that follow the same grid, like Montreal, where the grid is even denser than here, I think it might be encountering even more stops. But they have better management of their traffic, I have to say. Um, and when we do this as a much larger comparison with all the other cities, we do like to do these comparisons and see like how badly New York performs sometimes. Um, mean speed versus mean controlled intersection density. New York is there, quite of an outlier. Um, and on the right side is the mean speed versus the average bus stop distance. I think it's not only the controlled intersections, but together with how frequent the bus stops are, it is becoming an extremely disruptive um, factor in the trip scheduling. Because I'm sure many of you had the same experience. You get onto the bus, it stops for you, and the bus stop is positioned right before a stop sign or a traffic light. It kind of pulls out and it has to stop again for the red light again. Right? And especially in Manhattan, if you have all these people blocking the intersection, you might end up having to wait for another light. It might not pull off into the left lane. Like there's all of that things happen. So every stop is a big um, <clears throat> waste, not a waste of time, but lost time. And OK, the colors do match. So again, if you look here, the average stop distance in New York is much, much, much smaller than everywhere else in the, around the world. I have to acknowledge here that um, MTA has been working on a uh, redesign for their services. And um, two points that they make immediately relates to what we're trying to do here. One is that they're saying they want a better balance, faster service. We all do. Great. And the second one is that consolidating stops and making the buses stop less is one of their priorities. In reality, I don't know how well it will work because it's very hard to actually remove bus stops, right? Like the communities might not be happy and all of that. Uh, but still, I like when I show these, I'm not against MTA. I know that they work with like best of intentions and we use their services every day. Sometimes just like the other things in the urban environment might not necessarily allow you to do a lot of things that you want. And here, I think a lot of it is in the hands of DOT as well. Um, when we showed this study to many people, especially in New York, the reaction was that, well, New York is so much different than other cities. It's so much denser than the other cities. Of course, it's slow. So yes, the uh, denser the city is, the slower it seems the bus, tra bus services are. Uh, I don't think this is the only explanation for it. Right, like they're denser cities that have better services. Paris is one, it's almost twice as dense in the urban area. And also getting a good data on density is very, very difficult. Um, I know like NASA has this one kilometer square data set that I want to compare this with. But at the same time, I think it's too easy of an explanation, right? Just to say you cannot run a good service in a crowded city doesn't make sense. We have to, especially in New York, we have to. And given, um, how much of the surface of New York is actually is reserved for traffic, I think there's, there, 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 there's actually space for buses to move faster there. I have a few more things to show. There will be much more New York specific. I can go a little faster. Um, we took some random trips. Some of them are the ones that I'm interested. So B43, my bus is here. Um, and try to plot out their stops, right? Like how many times and when they stop. And uh, it's very hard to see from there, but the pink is bus stops and the blue, darker blue stop signs, lighter blue is traffic lights. And when you start looking at how many times B43, the poor bus stops there, it is practically not moving, right? Like this just stop over stop over stop. And combined, when it's combined with like the traffic stops versus bus stops, it's becoming a bit of a nightmare, really. Uh, but what is interesting here is that we're, we're starting to see some like, topologies, almost, of how stops are. Some uh, services tend to do very few stops, PK9. Some of them tend to do stops that are more clustered, and then they take longer routes. So we're planning to separate them out and look at these topologies, sep or typologies, I guess. Um, separately and try to see like best practices from around the world.
Which one? The B thirty nine, which you just mentioned. Uh, this one? BX thirty nine. Sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I said it's wrong. Hmm. Yeah, and like we haven't really looked at the extreme specifics of it, but I think like bus service seems to be a little slower in Bronx, especially north south, because I think most of the traffic is there to get people into Manhattan, and you have the huge uh, Grand Concourse running in the middle. That's a multi-way boulevard where there's less stop signs and crossing uh, through it that it might be operating a little faster. Um, this is showing the 25 routes with highest speed deviations in New York versus the 25 lowest ones. We have been noticing that the lowest speed deviation is from the buses that actually are already going slow all throughout the day. Um, and so it's not super clear, but especially with the highest deviations, the evening commute is much more clear to see. A few maps. Um, these are the highest deviations versus lowest deviations around the city. I think it's not very surprising for everyone, but the highest deviations are at the eastern um, part of Manhattan, the eastern side of Manhattan. Marco's interpretation for it was that there aren't many subway lines here, so these might be much more higher ridership services, so the boarding and alighting will take a lot longer. Um, and also, because of the bus, uh, no, sorry, not bus, what? Bridge entrances, there, there are these like hot spots of traffic. I think also at the, uh, yeah, where the Queensborough and the Central Park kind of intersects, it becomes quite unruly as well. Um, but at least we know that like which corridors tend to have quite a bit of problems. And the ones on the right are the services that have the least. The one I've been talking about, I think, oh, um, this one. This is uh, B62. That is one of my other art nemesis. It also drives me crazy. Um, I think that was the bus actually that took me 45 minutes to get to Clinton Hill on my first day in New York. B62 was recently truncated uh, within the last 10 years. Previously had gone to downtown Brooklyn. Mm. And they had it truncated because it's unreliable. It still is. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so. Then we start to think, like, can we, because we have information about stop to stop timing and speeds and the direct and the routes, we can actually get a quite specific high resolution map of bus speeds around the world in a comparison. New York's data doesn't come up extremely very um, nuanced here because all of the everything is kind of clustered around here. To be able to compare, we had to cut it at some point. Uh, and we broke it down throughout the day as well. Very, very early in, in, early in the morning at like 7 a.m. it seems to be fine. But other than that, like it is, even at 7 a.m. it's very slow. And as we start this study, I think I'm kind of getting a little too into it. So instead of taking the bus the other day, I ended up walking to Sarah's office in Bushwick from Greenpoint while I was racing with the bus. And I almost won. So, you know, like... Uh, actually, like it was a beautiful day. There were no double parking, no traffic, and I almost won. You know, so um, I I think like the data might have a lot of mistakes in it. I don't say it's the definite and then completely the correct uh, results because the bus service is so complicated. But just with the size of the data and the resolution that we're looking at it, I think we're coming into some uh, conclusions that we might be able to confirm. But also, I am a very biased observer in this too. So. Uh, we are going to start talking to people from agencies around the world, starting from North America next week. Um, we have our first appointment with Seattle next week. So we'll see what they say. And this is the same hourly service in comparison with Paris. Uh, I think like other than the extreme center of the city, Paris seems like at least the outer ring of it. Outer ring is still within the inner city, in, in the periphery road. Um, it tends to get a lot better. And they have a lot of very good practices around bus lanes. Um, and we want to understand like, how bus lanes affect traffic speed. That will be another second step in our study, where the bus lane data is not standardized around the world. We're going to try to do it standardized. Like, is it geographic data? Is it based on route names and things? Um, 
but we know that the applications in, let's say, Paris, in Bologna, and Zurich, like better performing cities, is better. It is heavily enforced uh, by the police as well. And um, maybe I will be in a good side to say it, but some of the cities that we compare have like large historic cores, right? Like, so either historic or different kind of like very dense city centers, like Izmir is one, Bologna is one, Zurich is one, where an area is designated as a core, there's a boundary around it, and um, the entrance with a car would be limited, the bus services would be different, a lot of roads would be only accessible by pedestrians, right? The very kind of a traditional image of a European downtown, let's say. And those cities, of course, have a better way of managing bus corridors because it's such a more limited environment. Maybe when we have the congestion pricing, we will have a better way of managing that as well. Here, what you see are the few spots in the city. This might be a mistake, by the way. I'm not really sure. Um, where the average speed is below nine kilometers per hour. Nine is not necessarily an important threshold, but it's where, like, actually, this map gets really focused. And you can say, okay, like, I know this is like lower mid. Uh, this is Midtown below Central Park. Of course, it's crowded. What do you expect, right? Like, it's very normal. But then, when you start looking at how many buses cross through there a very high number of bus trips end up actually crossing through these areas. So the congestion in these areas do slow down the traffic. There are bus lanes and bus corridors being implemented in these areas, I know. But uh, our initial study shows that the buses on bus lanes are not significantly faster. I'm assuming they're faster than what they would be if the lane is not there. But I can tell you from my experience in Numina, we've been watching bus lanes for a long time through with our sensors and um, bus lane obstructions or drivers using bus lanes, DOT allowing left turns on bus only streets are the kind of problems that are, I think, like a little bit half assed in the city, honestly, uh, that could make things better. So I'll go through these very quickly and we'll do a little, like if you guys have any comments, I have to know afterwards. So. We have a few conclusions. I'm not necessarily set on these. They're very much a work in progress. Some of them are just you know, things that you might know as well. Um, one, I think the buses stop very often. Um, in Marin Institute, um, Eric Goldwyn and Olan uh, Levy made a study about like how would they redesign Brooklyn's um, bus network. And their first suggestion was to reduce the number of bus stops. 250 meters is really too small, right? Like if you even start at the middle, 125 meters to the next bus stop, it is very small. We can, I think it's okay to walk a little for a more reliable bus service. Um, I think, I believe the slowdown associated with the traffic in like rush hours that is affecting the buses too much, separating buses properly so that cars are not using the bus lanes and things, uh, that could significantly make it much better. It sounds really easy, right? Like, yeah, of course, but Doing it is really difficult. We believe uh, if, it were to, if it was possible, actually, not doing significant touches to the bus service, but to the environment that it runs in would change our lives quite significantly. Why don't, like, if we have a bus corridor, if we consolidate bus routes into a single route, why do we still allow cars to cross these streets? We can do the directions in opposite directions, right? So, like, that will also remove traffic from a lot of residential streets. Um, we can assign hierarchies to the streets where buses have priority and bus stops. We can give um, red light priorities to buses so when they arrive the light can change. Also the cars in front and behind them will I'm sure take advantage of it so we'll need help from police, police cameras, right? Like we have the technology to do it very well. Um, the thing that's been talked for such a long time in New York, the making the boarding faster we can get people from behind, like from the back doors. Already, I think MTA on their subway service assumes a 50% fare evasion. You know, like you don't have much to lose there. Um, and also, like the bus driver is not, he doesn't warn people when they don't show the, when they don't press their tickets, right? Like it will be quite a dangerous thing to do for them. It will also really make the service very slow. So it's not like there's any advantage of going up front. Um, also, I think it's kind of unthinkable in US traffic, but I think we're allowing too much left and right turns in the city, especially left turns. Nowhere else in the world, as far as I know, you can really take a left turn 
but like it's kind of insane that we separate the whole lane in the city for that. It works well in suburban environments in the middle of downtown. It doesn't make too much sense. I know some streets are getting it removed and it's fantastic, uh, but more of it would be great. Then um, one thing I forgot to say, we intentionally did not look at obstruction and 311 data set. It's a, you know, like it's a, once you start looking into it, I think I'll be lost in the amount of data there. And it's not comparable with other cities. I'm sure I know that it slows the bus down, the bus uh, slows down the service very much, but it is already very slow even when there are no obstructions. And you know, it's again something to do with the police. Um, all of the code that we use to standardize data and to do the analysis is available here in GitHub. It is really not clean. It is not structured well. So if you want to use it, do it at your own risk. Um, our data is huge, and downloading it was quite a bit of a pain. So we haven't opened it. Contact me. I might be able to get it to you. Marco might want to publish something about it first, though. Um, but we decided to follow a very strict folder structure with our data. So if you were to want to use it, you'll have to kind of construct the same yourself, because in a multi city analysis with like stop signs and whatever, it kind of becomes a bit unruly. Um, yeah, that's it for me. Thank you. Uh, I've been doing my own studies. Uh, and there are two factors that I think you will omit it, uh, that I found to be fairly important with regard to bus routes. The first one happens to be the number of unmade passenger trips per distance. If you look at that, and I can only look at New York, I can only look at the US with regard to that because mm -hmm. that data is available uh, on the uh, National Transportation Data. Mm. I find out the following that uh, New York is way above almost every other city except San Francisco. They're about the same. What I did was I took the correlation of the bus speeds um, for both the distance between bus stops and the distance of the UPT. Uh, found out that the correlation for uh, stop distance is about 50%. The correlation for UPT. Uh, number of passengers per unit distance is 90%. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the factors which you should look at. Yeah. The second factor which you should look at with regards to bus lanes is the number is the number of bus crossings per hour at each intersection. Mm -hmm. I've done that study. Normally, in terms of the literature, the segment's about 120 or so per hour crossings per okay. for that. Uh, New York has something like over 100 crossings where this is way above that. Hmm. In particular, one of the areas that you saw with the very high, uh, very low speeds, you saw downtown Flushing. Yeah. Main Street and Roosevelt Avenue has over 150 for the entire day. Hmm. The worst case happens to be Jamaica in terms yeah. of that. So no matter what you do with, uh, with the numbers of uh, bus lanes, Getting rid of the cars or anything else, it's not going to help one bit. Hmm. Similarly, with regard to the loading and so forth, with regard to that UPT over uh, distance, it, over distance it means they're not running enough buses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I because agree. Because they're more there per se. Mm -hmm. And in terms of that, uh, you can't run them in terms of the areas where they're needed. Mm -hmm. The other two other points so you make when I have done some studies with regard to the Queen's redesign, mm -hmm. uh, the MTA relented and they uh, gave me, they did present the GTFS for the proposal. Mm. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, uh, it's available <laughs> on the website. Okay. Yeah. Uh, essentially, what they're doing is they're increasing the, mid, the spacing between stops from about 800 feet to 1,300, 1,200 feet. 1300. And they're increasing the average speed from 8.6 miles per hour. 8.8 miles. .8 oh, wow. <laughs> uh, what I did in terms of that with regard to bus speeds, that's not the whole point. The whole point is how long is the trip going to take? Mm -hmm. And so what I did was I did initially a study in Queens, taking the distance uh, from every single uh, census block to uh, one of the nearest subway stop, 
eliminated the you know, people more than half a mile of the so mm -hmm. And to look at how long it's going to take the person to walk to a bus stop and get to a subway stop. And it varies all over the place depending on the Of course, yeah. So therefore, you really have to find out uh, really where people are going and where they want to go. And as I said, the emphasis should be more on how long is the trip going to take, not how fast is the bus going. Mm -hmm. Because, quite frankly, bus, the average uh, distance for a bus, uh, bus journey in New York is about 2.4 miles. Mm -hmm. Which means, with regard to that, the actual bus speed, the time that they're on the bus, is less important than many of the other cities, which have twice the uh, distance. If you want to look at something that's comparable mm -hmm. in terms of your studies, take San Francisco in, in terms of that, uh, because mm -hmm. the numbers are relatively the same. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, let's talk about it separately so I can get another question, but yes, thank you. I'm sorry. Aside from the ones who are going to do other things, who want to go out, you can go out. I love my question. So, like, I, um, I'm curious if you could use your data to validate uh, critical collect phase. So, these are the other DOT things that you say, like, oh, which one they use, like, one more one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, um, Basically, say like during General Assembly, it's good luck day. During like Christmas, it's <laughs> yeah. good luck day. So I'm curious if there's like a more data hmm. approach here that we could maybe think about like predicting. Mm -hmm. I think you know, like in those, like to get to that analysis, then I would want to use the real time data coming from MTA because I think the schedules are still more or less set for averages. Right? Like if there's a known one specific day, so like the UN meetings, whatever. In Midtown, that they might not be reflected immediately. Um, so, yeah. But I think yes, generally. I was just wondering. Um, there's going to be a yes or no if you have time to get into it. I was wondering if the MTA uh, aggregated S SBS service in terms of the main group. For example, like there's differentiations on M14, the M15 in Manhattan. There's M15 select bus service and the standard M15. I was wondering if you found they sort of aggregated that, or did you consider that a separate group with its own data? In this data set, they're separate. So there will be M14 and there will be M14 plus. Right? So the SPSs are now plus, I think they're annotated as plus services. Um, yeah. Just a quick one. So on those, those uh, spatial average speed maps, mm -hmm. do you think that those would be a good proxy for just general traffic speed? Would they, would they differ in some, let's say I propose them to the, what the average traffic speed in San Francisco, mm -hmm. the symbol, would your maps be a good proxy thing for general traffic or would they differ in different yeah, unfortunately, yes. Like, that's the thing, and it shouldn't be, right? Because it's like usually shared very widely because you have maybe like 50 people in a bus, or a bus lane might be used by a thousand people when a car lane is used by much less. I think the environmental conditions should not be pulling down the bus services so much. Of course, it does. Many reasons, like when you're driving, you know, people like to stop in the middle of the intersection and don't move, and buses can't really navigate around these and things, but still, it is, yes. I believe. If, uh, yeah. Okay, so for the charts of um, miles per hour versus stops per mile in a given city, have you tried using like a long block relationship there instead of linear? Because that doesn't really look. I know, yeah. We, for right now, um, like because we have a lot of cities, we're trying to keep it simple. So as we get into like more. Um, like research into specific cities, then like we'll try to do a little bit more than the linear relationships. And at this point, I don't necessarily care if it's linear or logarithmic relation. I just know that there is a relation, right? Like we're just leaving it very vague for now to have like material in the next steps of the study. In relation to what you said earlier, have you considered using like uh, vehicle hours divided by passenger miles as a measure instead of? Um, I don't know if I have the, oh, you said like the data is available? The data, the data that the MTA public, National Transportation uh, publishes is the vehicle revenue miles divided by vehicle revenue hours. Okay. There is one systemic uh, problem with that. <clears throat> vehicle revenue hours includes layover time. Mm. And one of the reasons why uh, new MTA's buses are so inefficiently run 
the worst in the world in terms of dollars per vehicle revenue hour, is that their layover time is a, 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 is a little bit higher than most of the other uh, operators. Mm. So you have some biases with regard to that. Yeah. So if, let's say, somebody is saying, hey, I can walk fast because the time is only, the vehicle speed is only six miles an hour, mm. or whatever, they're not including everything. There should be an asterisk. Okay. Um, do I have time to get one more question? Uh, if I understood correctly, you're using trips.txt. Um, yes, I mean, for individual trips, yes, and then like we aggregate the geometry to each one of them and the stop time, yeah, and the stop, first stop and last stop, yeah. I'm wondering if you were considering using any real time Yeah, I, I want to get into it, but I'm a little bit afraid of the workload that it will entail right now. And also, the, like, I have to find a way to automate the data collection for it, right? Like, if if the CD has the record of the historic data and I can get to it, it will be fantastic. But right now, just keeping a script running in a computer on a server and collecting data, it just it's not very efficient for us to do it. But so yes and no, there's like both of them. On, on that point, because uh, I actually spent a long time last year looking for industrial time. Uh, uh, didn't find anything until months ago. My daughter told me about a resource put together by Hmm. They have a fairly slow API um, for real time in a bunch of US cities. Um, you can also just email him. Okay. And he'll give you access to hmm. uh, reasonable length. But, uh, yeah, I mean, MTA has it too. MTA has to have their. I, I, the you just have to make like continuous requests, I think, to it. Yeah, but this is, this is like just all archival. Oh, great archival, fantastic. Uh, I have a question to you. Pretty early on in the presentation, there was like the bus speed and it's near like flat. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was wondering, because I thought it was that a box plot of like the variability? Yeah. So it was very, like, a very large variance between the triplet lengths in each period of the day. Yeah, they don't, like, I didn't look at it extremely carefully, but I noticed that, like, if you plot them, they just come out Maybe like region by region, some several speeds or something, but I'm going to go back to it because I think that's it's a specific way that the Turks have been using this data because Istanbul has the same, and for some reason they think their buses are at 25 kilometers per hour throughout the day, and it really doesn't. So, you know, like there's some, some issue there, uh, but it's definitely worth going into. But for all, all the data that I showed, there's definitely a lot of variability because right? like we can't... Um, expect a bus to go at the same speeds at like Midtown versus like, I don't know, Eastern Williamsburg or something, right? So there's, yeah, there's definitely that. And the other thing I wanted to point out is that you had the, uh, the graph of uh, stop distance versus the average bus speed. Yeah. And there was New York and Paris. Yeah, I think the same. Um, it wasn't this one, it was the other one where I had the individual cities. Hmm. Um, but it was Paris had an average stop speed. In the meters, I think it was. Yeah. In New York, it was 200. Yeah, this one. So, yeah. But, but Paris is only a little bit faster. Mm -hmm. Even though they have this much, much larger stop space. So, I just wanted to point out that. Yeah. But stop distances may not actually. Help. It's not the, yeah, it's not the only thing that explains. Yeah, I think also like every kilometer kind of counts there, like the small distance. In between them is like, I don't know, maybe like 7% or so. So, I don't know. It um, it does make a difference. And I just like generally urban density of Paris is almost twice as New York. So like they're in a different environment. It's very hard to compare. But yeah, um, just as a comparison, I think it's a good benchmark to have. And yeah, we're hoping to get like London in as well. We're trying to get Mexico City in, but their data is missing some stuff. So hopefully we're going to have a better, like these very large cities with large urban, like dense urban centers in it so that we have, we have a better comparison. So if any of you are familiar with any city that has good GTFS data, big cities, I'd be happy to talk to you guys. Well, um, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.